Well, this is a roller coaster of a passage, isn't it? From the heights of God's grace and mercy leading to gospel fruit in verse eight to the stark challenge for Isaiah to preach that gospel until it ends in judgment. And I've tried deliberately to follow the ups and downs of this passage so that we can feel the full force of what God is saying to us this morning. Gospel fruit, gospel judgment. And now verse 13, gospel hope. Verse 13. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. That final phrase kind of hits you out of nowhere, doesn't it? We're racing along through judgment on the land. Verse 11, until the cities lie ruined with an inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. And it looks like God is back to inflict more punishment. That was the pattern in chapter five, you'll remember. So chapter five, verse 25. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuge in the streets. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. And off we go through more and more judgment in verses 26 to 30 in Isaiah 5. Back then, we were crying out for some respite. Surely God's mercy will shine through somewhere in chapter five. And it never does. So as we come to the end of chapter six, we're perhaps expecting it to go the same way. Verse 13. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps and we're expecting it to say, so God will burn up the stumps and grind them into the ground. But no, suddenly there is this striking change of key, an image of hope. The stump is not burned down further. Suddenly. The stump is described as the holy seed. It's a striking image, isn't it? The stump that becomes a seed, a holy seed, no less. Holy, like God. What is Isaiah guessing at? So far, we've only seen one person respond well to the gospel, Isaiah himself. The rest of chapter six seems pretty hopeless. Will no one respond with repentance? Will they all reject the gospel and harden their hearts? That seems to be the implication of verses 9 to 13a. But back in chapter 4, Isaiah gave us an expectation that there would be some who remain, a remnant who respond to the gospel like Isaiah did, who are washed of their sin as Isaiah was and called holy. Have a look at chapter 4. Verses four and five, sorry, three and four. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Notice, as we did last week, that it is through judgment that this remnant of God's people will be made clean, will be made holy. And as we move through chapters 7 to 12, we find there are other references to this remnant, a group alongside Isaiah himself, who are taking the Lord's word seriously. For example, chapter 8, verse 16, bind up the testimony and seal up the law among my disciples plural. So that by chapter 12, which in many ways mirrors chapter 6, as we'll see when we get there, the experience of Isaiah seems to be matched by a group that he is teaching. So chapter 12 verses 4, 5 and 6. In that day you will say, the people he's teaching, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. 
Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Notice he is forecasting a day when God will dwell with these people among them. They must therefore be a holy people because God can only dwell among the holy as he is holy, holy, holy. So where we saw gospel preaching leading only to judgment in verses 9 to 13a, now we see that perhaps gospel preaching for some will lead to gospel hope. It will not all be negative responses to the gospel. The warnings will be heeded by more than just one. And perhaps from the few, that same gospel will go out beyond the confines of national Judah who have rejected it and instead to the nations. Chapter 12, verse 5, I just read. Chapter 2, verse 3. But as well as the hope of a remnant saved through judgment that runs through Isaiah, there is also the hope of a saviour, a messiah, who will be the means of their salvation. And that saviour is described variously in these next few chapters. Emmanuel, God with us, wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. That Messiah will rule over the kingdom of David, Israel's greatest king. And in 11 verse 1, he is described as a shoot from the stump of Jesse, Jesse being King David's father. So we end up with two possible meanings for this stump that becomes a holy seed. In that it, the, the remnant, a group of faithful Israelites, who repent and believe like Isaiah and ultimately take the gospel to the nations and the Messiah who comes from the stump and will ultimately be their salvation. And of course, they're both true. Jesus comes from the remnant. Mary and Joseph are shown to be believing Israelites at the start of Luke and Matthew's gospels. And his disciples are made up of believing Israelites, especially the women who stick with him right to the end. But also the men who repent and are restored after his resurrection and who take the gospel to the nations as prophesied. The remnant and the Messiah who comes from the remnant are inextricably bound together. So no wonder the image is almost seems to confuse the two. Whatever way we look at it, then God's gospel is effective. It is effective in judgment. When the gospel is preached and people harden their hearts against it, they are ultimately turning away from the God who could save them. But it is also effective in giving hope. As judgment falls, God's true people are saved through judgment as the judgment falls on their Messiah. Indeed, we see how crucial it is that the gospel does both when we come to the cross. The hardness of heart that we saw in God's people, the Pharisees and the Herodians asking for a sign, even though they'd seen all the miracles, ultimately leads them to nail their Messiah to a cross. So as the gospel brings judgment on them in that they reject and put to death their only hope, so God's true people, the believing remnant, are given hope through his death. So the gospel is effective in bringing judgment and hope at the same time. And the gospel is effective in producing fruit as we marvel at God's wisdom in bringing us hope through judgment the disciples go out and proclaim the gospel he ransomed us for his service like Valjean so surely we must respond like Isaiah did here I am send me so please choose will the gospel be judgment to you or hope will you produce fruit in keeping with repentance or will you remain wise in your own eyes?
And will you help to proclaim this gospel to the nations, whether it be for judgment or hope, knowing that God's gospel is effective either way? Let me pray for us. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Our Father, thank you for your gospel of grace. Thank you that our guilt can be taken away. We know our sins are many. Please, Lord, make us wise enough to see them, humble enough to repent of them, and grateful enough to produce fruit for your kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the shoot from the stump of Jesse, our hope. Amen. And we're going to continue in prayer now, and Patricia is going to lead us.